Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of I Like to Read with me, your host, Rachel Polanski. Believe it or not, we are on episode 53, How Crazy Is That?, which means it has officially been, I think, over a year since I Like to Read has been on the air. So if you've been listening since the beginning, thank you. If you are new here, hello, welcome, glad to have you. Um, Anything exciting coming up? Well, besides it being not super hot outside but like we turn off the ac and i'm like probably make this a quick one as usual but it's just you know the temp for temperature sakes um tony magistrali my former professor at university of vermont and renowned stephen king and horror expert amongst other things um released a new book called the on the illustrations of edgar Allan poe i am definitely not as familiar with poe as i am with the king universe but I am still somewhat familiar with his works and excited to dive into that book. I just haven't had time yet between work and TV shows and library books, but I do have it on my Kindle and ready to read. And as soon as I read that, we're going to have a really awesome interview out for you. So stay, so stay tuned. Um, and if you haven't seen that already, if you're new here, besides my weekly sort of diatribes and musings and five recommendations, I do sprinkle in author interviews, some with more mainstream quote unquote authors. Um, there's a really awesome true crime episode about hell in the heartland with Jack Miller, so true crime fans, check that one out. Like I mentioned, if you want to check out the Stephen King episode in horror, check out that episode with Tony. Um, if you're into Disney and sort of the history of Disney and the scholarship behind that, I have an episode on that. So we cover all sorts of bases here on the I Like to Read universe, and I'm also open to suggestions. If there is an author or a person, doesn't even have to necessarily be an author, it can be a person sort of periphery to the literary community, as I would like to think of myself. I'm not an author, I'm not really a writer, but I like to think that I support the literary community and enjoy continuing the conversations and talking to different people who are involved in different ways. So if there's anyone that you think, or if you are someone who you think would be cool, Always happy to chat and feature you on an episode, so feel free to reach out to me. I like to read pod at gmail.com or message me on Instagram, blah, 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 before we actually get started. Also, if you are not already, please make sure you are subscribed on YouTube. Make sure you are subscribed on Apple Podcasts. Follow me on Spotify if you are able to leave five stars and not only a five-star review, but a written review on Apple Podcasts and send me a screenshot of that, then I will give you a shout out on the podcast. And... Other than that, I mean, not too much is new. Just sort of been plugging along, reading as usual, working as usual, um, trying to, you know, the state of the world is changing every day, changing every week, trying too much to like not think about it while also like recognizing that I am a functioning member of society and for better or worse, part of the big machine. So anyways, speaking of society, (laughs) society, let us get started with our first book, which is called Monster She Wrote, The Woman Who Pioneered pioneered horror and speculative fiction. Now, this is written by Lisa Kroger and Melanie Anderson. So this is really cool. It is a collection, not so much a collection of essays, but more an exploration, as the title states, into the women who are responsible for starting the horror genre, for um, for the formative world of fantasy, and the women who kind of created these archetypes and these stories and monsters that are so important in literature. And so they start all the way sort of back to the beginning and the genesis, more or less, of when these stories kind of came into the modern day fold, more or less, as we know them, all the way up to the present day. So it's really cool. This is one for readers, one for lovers of horror and writing. And when I say one for readers, it's not necessarily one for readers in the sense that like it's super long and wordy and full of rich metaphor and text, but it's just really cool and informative and lets us know about the women and the people responsible for so many different stories. And like I mentioned, archetypes and um, what's the word, you know, sort of just like forms. And they said they paved the way for so many different points in literature. So they of course start, you know, with Mary Shelley, excuse me, uh, water break. They start with Mary Shelley. I mean, they they cover some of the more familiar ones. I mean, if, you know, there's V.C. Andrews, of course, Flowers in the Attic, Incest Formative. Of course, they talk about Shirley Jackson. They talk about some more contemporary authors who, of course, you know, by my own stupid prejudice and ignorance are the ones that I'm more familiar with. But what was really great about this is they give all of these women, you know, some, of course, of the more familiar names that I've mentioned that you've probably heard of, but also women such as Margaret Cavendish, who wrote a science fiction novel 150 years ago. And I had literally never heard of her or of the science fiction novel. Of course, you know, we've heard of Octavia Butler and we've heard of speculative horror fiction, but um, there's over, um, okay, so yeah, I think the, I don't remember exactly, this Goodreads is telling me that there's over a hundred different authors that it introduces you to, and so I think, you know, 
there's a lot of different little vignettes. I don't think there's actually a hundred stories, but in some of the other stories they touch, or in some of the introductions too, just because they don't necessarily devote an entire, you know, five or 10 page history to one author doesn't mean that they don't mention them. So there's tons of reading suggestions to go from here. This is also a great one to read if you're sort of in between books and you're looking for something of this, you know, this is for maybe the non-committal reader who sort of just wants to pick it up, learn a little bit more also for people who love history, because of course, like I said, it goes back to the 1700s, the 1800s, the sort of genesis and can, um, the, the women who, whose names we know and whose names we don't know and whose names you will hopefully remember <laughs> at least better than me, but maybe, you know, could, pretty much anyone could be better than me. Um, but whose name, you know, maybe hopefully you'll take away at least one new author and one new piece of history and one new book recommendation to read from this because I know I definitely did. All right. Next, we have It Needs to Look Like We Tried by Todd Robert Peterson. So this, by all intents and purposes, said it was a novel, so I was a little bit confused going into it because, spoiler alert, it definitely reads a lot more like a collection of short stories, and you could read them individually, you could sort of go in blind reading them out of order, but what you'll quickly learn after the second short story is that the characters from the first story are maybe somewhat more in the background of the remaining stories, maybe they are mentioned in name only, maybe someone who we previously met, we get to see their perspective, but it's sort of a twisting and turning tapestry of all the different lives of all these different people and these sort of weird, uncanny, not necessarily like horror, but in the sense that like something is like a little bit weird and weird, but in the sense that like it's relatable enough because also like everyday life is weird and those are the things that we remember. So we start off with a young man who's driving cross country on his way to his father's wedding. He accidentally hits a dog and kind of stops and pays his respects to the dog through that gets involved with this woman's family. Um, we then learn that there's other people involved. There's like a reality TV show couple where one of the husbands is like having an affair. So we get to see all different kinds of people, all different kinds of classes. I really like the way that this one Goodreads review put it, um, less than a novel than a tapestry of misery, desperation, and regret. So yes, it's, <laughs> it's definitely a darker one. It's not so much like thriller, rape, gore, but it's really, you know, it is the misery and regret of sort of the underbelly of life and the things that no one really likes to talk about, but the things that happen to everyone and that we should be talking about. Um, so as the review continues, the sideways humor and vivid settings act like duct tape to keep the machinery moving forward. Well written. So, I mean, yeah, like, it's not, again, so much about, like, any particular character sticking out to you or anyone. I know that sometimes people don't love short stories because, like I've mentioned before, people are, the biggest complaint is like, oh, I spent all this time and all this connection with someone only to have them killed or to stop learning about them 20 pages in. But what's really great about this is you get to revisit the different characters. And even if you don't necessarily revisit them in the story sense, you get to see sort of how they play a larger piece in this moving tapestry known as life. And next, we have The Final Girl Support Group by Grady Hendrix. So as the title might, <laughs> so you may or may not have known about the t that title, this is about final girls, this is about horror, this is a fictional novel that is definitely more of like a horror thriller, but I read a couple other things by Grady Hendrix, like the Southern Gothic guide to book club something or like my best friend's extra so he's really good at do the, the horror comedy balance definitely sort of like if ryan murphy were a little less obvious with everything he's doing and i mean that sort of in the best way possible like not to say that anything that grady hendrix does is understated because the final girl support group there is a group of fictional final girls who um he definitely plays with the the notion of the final girl if you're not familiar the final girl you know sort of like laurie strode um we have Sydney Prescott, Nancy from Nightmare on Elm Street. It's always the the one young woman who survives the villain and comes back to haunt him or have them haunt or have the villain haunt them another day, another sequel. So our main character, Lynette, is a final girl and she attends this final girl support group and all the other women in this support group have been in some sort of murder or some sort of horrific crime that are sort of doled out in little anecdotal notes throughout the book, which is really cool. So it's not only like flashback to their crime, but we also get to see like little bits of police evidence and little diary entries that open us up a little bit more into these characters. They're all very different, but they share this final girl grueling experience of having been like the one who survives and carrying that trauma and guilt with you because yes, you are a victim, but you're also a survivor. And there's in a lot of these instances because these women are final girls, they've had to live with this notoriety and this sort of, you know, wanting to disappear and be anonymous because 
they recognize how close tragedy is. So we get, um, they're sort of already moving past their tragedy more or less when a new tragedy strikes, one of the final girls goes missing and it turns out that someone is picking them off one by one. So it's very unclear, excuse me, as uh, very unclear. So it's sort of unclear what is going on. There's a mystery within the mystery because we not only understand that like Lynette is like a little bit of a reli unreliable narrator. She's a final girl. She's been through some trauma, but her story may not be as clear as it seems in the way it's hinted. There's a lot of sort of, can you trust? Can you not trust these people? It's very fast paced, um, but because there is that final girl friendship and that bond and this girl that groups everyone together, that's really the heart of the story. And I think what made this more than just sort of like a, oh, look, he's playing with the final girl show, because there's definitely been a couple of movies like the final girl or whatever that in theory, like to play with this idea of the final girl and like poking fun and making some sort of meta commentary, but like it doesn't always play off as anything unique. It may definitely be entertaining, but I don't feel like I've come away taking anything different from that. And with this, I feel like we got a sort of different look into what makes a final girl, how they are portrayed in the media and how, and beyond that too, just like a commentary on how women can control their own stories as survivors and just survivors in general, regardless of whether or not you are a final girl, because anyone who survived any sort of tragedy is sort of a final girl themselves, even if they weren't the only one to survive and just, you know, for convenience's sake in these cases they were, but yeah. And next we have Night Bitch by Rachel Yoder. So I've definitely read a lot of different books about motherhood. Some have been super positive, some have been less positive, some have been like downright terrifying, like the push comes to mind. This is one that really landed at that intersection of horror and disfigurement and like the, a commentary on the woman's body and the way that a woman is perceived both internally and externally sort of like what the movie false positive was trying to do but like what rosemary's baby succeeded at much more much better um so it deals with this woman rachel or i'm sorry the author's name is rachel we never really get to know her name we just sort of know her as the woman and the night bitch and the mother and from the beginning she is sort of like going through this transformation and at first you feel like it's definitely more of like a metaphorical like oh the woman as beast and the mother and learning her role in society and whatnot and then very clearly it seems that like no this is like an actual transformation but more than just a werewolf uh, again it's definitely like it walks that line of definitely mixing metaphor and sort of societal commentary and what it means to be a mother in 2021 and beyond and to be a modern day woman and deal with all these conflating feelings of motherhood and connection with just like the primal body horror because like what does happen if you don't feel this connection to your physical form and how are you able to separate that and keep your mind and love your child it's definitely you know while it is like a darker sort of transformative um, theme and you know the word bitch is in the title it's definitely lighter than the push or other books that I've read there's no sort of um, darkness in the sense that you know it's dark in that it portrays what it is very even though it's fictional what it's like to be a mother and the struggles and the inner demons literally um, but there is no death there's no sexual assault there's nothing like that so definitely a little more fun um, very easy to read like 250 pages really fast paced so like if you're into stuff like I want to say it's like the fly meets the push meets like slightly more domestic motherhood drama um, check this one out and last, but certainly not, certainly not least, we have Everything Now, Lessons from the City State of Los Angeles by Rosencrantz Baldwin. This is a really cool nonfiction book that takes little, I mean, I don't even know how to describe it. Like it's not so much a look at Los Angeles and look at the city and here's a different tour, but it sort of makes the case as to why Los Angeles is like this city state that has been able to remain this ubiquitous and undefinable city that is so different and unique from so many other cities and as someone who's lived in los angeles for over five years at this point of course i can relate to it and knowing a lot of the landmarks and the history and of you know i'm not a native angelino but i do feel a great affinity to what is my current and very likely indefinite future city there's so much mythology, there's so much history, there's so much richness. Um, every city has that, but Los Angeles is, is particularly, you know, whether it's because, of course, you know, you have the Hollywood movie industry, you have all the different native people, you have the Mexican border, you have the Pacific Ocean, you have so many different components. So Ros Rosencrantz Baldwin, you know, not only looks into like a history of Los Angeles, but also does some definitely like sociological and anthropological research and, ar you know, really argues too for how 
this city can just, you know, he he takes different people's stories. So there's like also ethnographies and different collections of different random people. So he's, you know, not only a boots on the ground journalist, but also historian and research. So it's just a really great mix of all those different things. So if you're into nonfiction, if you're into history, whether or not you live in Los Angeles, if you want to learn more about the beautiful city that I and millions and millions of others call home and the way that this city is the same but different for everybody else and more than just because we all have different perspectives but because this city is so wild and diverse and just a bunch of different little neighborhoods thrown together it's different for everyone so that's that i hope you enjoyed listening let me know as always what you are reading and until next time stay reading bye